they plan to run against him. The winners get to make policy. Uh, the losers go home. And believed Republicans were ready to turn the page. If you're tired of losing, put your trust in a new generation. Yet at the end of a historic week in American politics. The only crime that I have committed is to fearlessly defend our nation from those who seek to destroy it. Donald Trump's top GOP challengers are suddenly on his side after falling into line and blasting criminal charges against the former president. You see this guy in Manhattan, this district attorney, they're weaponizing the prosecutorial power to advance a political agenda. Maybe it's targeting a politician they don't like. Republican rivals fear their opening against Trump may have closed a bit after Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's indictment on 34 counts. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. Prompted a storm of outrage, even from some of Trump's fiercest critics, like Senator Mitt Romney, who called it a dangerous precedent, saying, I believe President Trump's character and conduct make him unfit for office. Even so, I believe the New York prosecutor has stretched to reach felony criminal charges in order to fit a political agenda. With Republican wagons circling around Trump, or at least against his indictment, it's unclear when the window to forcefully challenge his candidacy will open again, or who will dare to try. We've got a liberal prosecutor that's doing political revenge against a former president. I mean, that's not a precedent that you want to have. Not long ago, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis did tiptoe around a critique of Trump's predicament with Stormy Daniels. I don't know what goes into paying hush money to a porn star to, to secure silence over some type of alleged affair. I just, I can't speak to that. Before quickly dropping any references to porn stars and hush money, and simply going on the attack against the New York prosecutor. When asked Friday whether the indictment influenced his plans to run, DeSantis answered like this. It's affected me in the sense that it's reinforced this problem we have in our country uh, where we have the political left weaponizing uh, the rule of law, actually abandoning the rule of law by weaponizing it and using it against people they don't like. And that needs to stop in this country. And an orthodox presidential primary becomes even more so. Advisors to Republican campaigns tell CNN the biggest risk of all is to get crosswise with voters deeply loyal to Trump, who once again is dominating and overshadowing the race. This fake case was brought only to interfere with the upcoming 2024 election, and it should be dropped immediately, immediately. Even though former President Trump has effectively frozen this Republican race into place, at least for now, the show must go on. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who's running against Trump, is going to Iowa next week to campaign. And Senator Tim Scott is also dipping his toe into the waters, traveling to Iowa and New Hampshire as he decides whether to jump into this race. There is no doubt the 2024 campaign has been changed dramatically by the Trump indictment. It's an open question, though, if that Trump exhaustion out there among so many Republican voters does still exist. Jeff Zeleny, CNN. Washington. And Jeff, thank you for that report. Let's discuss now with CNN political analyst and Princeton University historian and professor Julian Zelizer. Julian, good to see you. Typically, I come to you for um, some historical example that informs this moment. I don't think there is one for a primary that now includes a former president who's been indicted. But let's look at the latest CNN poll here. Six out of 10 Americans support the indictment, roughly that. 62% of uh, independents support it. So Trump is holding strong in the party. But within the party, how much does electability beyond the, the primary matter to these voters? Well, as of now, uh, that doesn't seem to be the top consideration. A former president running for re-election indicted, and he ends the week more popular than ever before. Uh, he's rallied Republicans around him. He has crafted his message in some ways of once again him fighting the establishment. And it seems, at least now, uh, that Republican voters are more focused on that than questions of general election electability. Primaries come first, and primaries usually determine uh, where this all goes. Yeah, and how about the lesson of, of 2016, though, when Republicans, after at least those anti-Trump Republican candidates, 
um, said that maybe they waited too long to just square up with Trump directly and take him on. Is that supposed to be happening at this point in the process? Should we, we be waiting deeper into the summer, into the fall? Well, I, I don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, I think it's like waiting for Godot. It, it's just not coming. It didn't come in 2016, and I'm not convinced that's going to happen now. I think they are more scared of him now than they were back in the 2015, 2016 period. He's more formidable. He has a bigger platform. So I don't, I, I don't expect many of them to go after him. The question is, what happens if there are more indictments on issues that are more politically problematic, including uh, the case in Georgia? And so that's really where we're going to get a gauge if there's ever uh, going to be any serious never Trumpism within the Republican Party. All right, let's turn to the Democrats now. Uh, President Biden obviously has not yet announced re-election uh, privately. CNN's reporting is that uh, he says he is definitely uh, running. However, he's not chosen a campaign manager. He's not chosen the location of uh, his campaign headquarters. Uh, the date of the announcement is still up in the air. Although he says he's definitely running, is there some byproduct of the delay of the announcement from th the president, although people know it's coming? Well, I mean, it creates space for a Democrat to potentially step in uh, the more you wait and to say that they want to mount a primary challenge. But as of now, the Democratic field is pretty quiet, and I think they're waiting for him to announce, even if it comes a little later than they expect. On paper, uh, despite questions about his stamina and age, he still remains a pretty formidable incumbent just on paper. And I don't think the delay is really going to have a big effect on his candidacy. Your latest piece for CNN.com focuses on uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, ProPublica reported this week that he's traveled for decades lavishly uh, on the dime of a mega donor, a Republican supporter who he also calls a friend. He released a, a, a lengthy statement saying that he reported as he told he was supposed to. Those uh, disclosure rules are changing and, and he will abide by those. Um, he's not recused himself from the January 6th uh, cases, although his wife has tried to undermine elections. Um, it, this is a lifetime appointment. So what do we do with all this information? There, there likely will not be any impeachment of, of Justice Thomas. So what now? Well, look, there is the Thomas question, the question about what happens to him. But there's the revelation for many Americans there are no ethics codes guiding the Supreme Court justices. A lot of this is about informal guardrails and justices making the right decision. And I think what the story reveals is there's a lot of room not to make the right decision. So I think there needs to be a conversation uh, about the Supreme Court and if not the Supreme Court Congress through legislation creating some form of ethics codes as other federal judges are subject to so that this kind of uh, behavior is not permissible. And if it happens, there's, there are penalties. Uh, but we don't have that right now. So there is actually a lot of space uh, for Justice Thomas to uh, engage in this kind of relationship. But I think we need to look at the structures of the codes, not just at the individual. Yeah, and as we uh, had a guest on yesterday from Fix the Court who says that he wishes, actually, there was a more liberal justice who did the same thing, so it wouldn't be in a partisan uh, framework that these rules could actually be uh, in place. But that's not in place, so likely things won't change in the near term. Julian Zelizer, thanks so much.